I would like to introduce our speaker today um, for our ACL Virtual World Interest Group. We're going to hear from um, Nancy Zingrone. I hope I said your name right, Nan. You can um, correct Perfect. me if I'm wrong. Okay, and um, she received her PhD in psychology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and she's a research psychologist who combines her 30-year fascinated fascination with exceptional experiences with her passion for teaching, and she's active in virtual worlds and um, has held some Second Life MOOCs to um, help people come into virtual worlds for the purpose of education, particularly with emphasis, her emphasis on psychology. And she has built some library resources in Second Life. And so today, I think our topic will be of interest to anyone who's working in the field of education in virtual worlds, as well as librarians. She's going to talk about supporting a course with a virtual world library. So please help me welcome uh, Maggie Laramore or Nan Zingrone. Thank you, and take it away, Nan. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm really uh, honored to have been asked to come and talk to you guys. I'm a, a huge fan of the Community Virtual Library and everything that it does, and of, of Val's um, huge body of work of, across some years here. It's a wonderful installation and a wonderful opportunity for those of us who are amateur librarians to learn and um, really get more instruction on how to do things and some wonderful examples that we can replicate for our own um, interests. So I'm going to be talking about two different things today. Oh, before I uh, go on, um, there's a box right behind me which says parapsychology on it. That's the topic that we're going to be, uh, the, the topic that my library covers and the course that I'm going to talk about covers. It's not a course for learning how to be psychic or have these exceptional experiences. It's a course for um, learning what's going on on the scientific side of the field. If you click on that box, you'll get a note card that gives you the link to the PowerPoint presentation on my slideshare.net account. So you can download it and then all the lo uh, links will be live on, um, on the PowerPoint when you download it. And I'm it's all open open source and everything is uh, images that I have either paid for or made myself. So you're perfectly welcome to use it in, in any way that you want, as long as I get a little bit of a credit for um, having produced the original, the original thing. Anyhow, um, it also has more information on the Paramount course. One is still in progress and on next year's course, as well as uh, information on how to get the playlists from last year's course and this year's course, which are now in progress, and some other good good tidbits. So I hope you all uh, get your goodies out of that box. So the the structure of the talk is going to be twofold. First, I'm going to talk about why the Azire, our library, that's a picture of it in in on the screen there, is the Alvarado Zingroni Institute for Research and Education, and I'll tell you why that is in a minute. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the field because it's not what people normally think about when they hear the word parapsychology. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the space as well, which is um, something that uh, I've been working on for my husband and I started in 2009, and I've been working on the content of uh, ever since. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the Paramook. Now, Paramook stands for Massively Open Online Course about Parapsychology, Scientific Parapsychology Research and Education. And it's not two psychologies, actually. Um, it's an odd word that was coined to mean kind of beyond psychology or beside psychology. It's, it's sort of an unfortunate word, but it covers the scientific study of seemingly psychic phenomena and other exceptional experiences as well. So uh, that's why it's called Paramook for short, because parapsychology research and education is a mouthful. And when I start talking about that, I'll talk a little bit about the structure of the course, the philosophy of the course, and then the outcome of our two iterations of the course. We taught it first in January and February of 2015 with monthly discussion forums going through August of 2015. And we started the second one this past January, finished the live classes at the end of February, and we still have two end of month um, discussion forums to go. We'll be closing up the course in August so we can start planning the next one. 
in uh, September and October. So this is a picture of a group of people at one of our conventions in 2012, and there's about 300 members of the association, which means there are about 300 people on the planet who identify as scientists or academics who study the scientific side of the field. They may be historians or anthropologists, sociologists, engineers, but mostly we're psychologists. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that picture when it comes up again later on in the talk. So scientific parapsychology is a highly controversial field of study. It's generally believed to be outside of the margins of mainstream science. We are under attack frequently from people who believe that the phenomena don't exist, that there's no such thing as psychic phenomena, there's no such thing as telepathy or precognition or any of the experiences that people have been reporting for um, eons and eons. Um, so it's a it's a, a difficult a difficult field to be in, and most of us who work in the field uh, work part time in the field. Um, it's very there are very few. We figure maybe fifty full time researchers in parapsychology on the planet as a whole, which is not a very large number. So it's the scientific academic study of psychic phenomena. It's largely unknown. Most people know a lot about the paranormal from newspapers and movies and uh, Ghostbusters notwithstanding. Things aren't like that. Um, uh, lots of uh, other outlets in media and in popular culture. But what we do, people really don't know a whole, oh, X-Files, my favorite thing. Um, people don't really know what we do. It's a multi multidisciplinary and multinational uh, group of people, but as I said, only a handful of researchers worldwide, maybe 150 people, 200 people that are actively pursuing it to maybe 5% to 10% of their working time, and then another larger group of folks who are very, very interested in the field. The real work is very obscured by the distortions and exaggerations of popular media and sometimes by amateur researchers as well. There's lots and lots of ghost hunters out there, some of whom are really um, uh, wonderful people, very knowledgeable and uh, do a very careful practice. And others of them are not so um, not so good at what they do, but they're famous nonetheless. So we, we suffer um, kind of from both sides. Uh, of the line, people who believe in the paranormal and people who are scientists and think we shouldn't be doing this work. So one of the reasons um, both of these, uh, one of the reasons the Paramook project is actually happening, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, is because it's been supported by Lisa Coley, the president of the Parapsychology Foundation. Her foundation has been around since 1951. I'm actually 10 months older than the foundation. Um, and it's always been dedicated to the scientific study of psychic phenomena. It was founded by her grandmother, Eileen J. Garrett, who was a medium and an entrepreneur, and run by her parents in, from 1970 um, to the early 2000s, and then her mother, mid-2000s, and then Lisa took over recently. Uh, we have one of the research associates from the Parapsychology Foundation in the audience, Gonzalo um, P.F., who I, I think has somebody sitting on his lap at the moment. Um, and, uh, and of course myself, I'm here, but we are able to spend the time and energy on the, the course itself, mainly because she supported um, my husband and I uh, during the time that we're teaching, so we can really spend our time working on the course, and that's made a huge difference. We originally intended to volunteer our time, not realizing how many students we were going to get or how big an undertaking it was. So it's been very, very good for us to have uh, to have her helping us out with that. And she's someone that we've been involved with um, since 1998. She's been a client and, a, and is now a very close personal friend. So first, let's talk about the library itself. It, so this section is called Why the Desire. And as you can see, that's me sitting behind my, my computer at the reception desk on the main floor of the uh, Azire Library and Learning Center in Manhupac on um, one of the continents of Second Life. One of the reasons why I got interested in Second Life was to learn about online teaching. Back in 2009, I was retraining to try and find an online teaching job. 
And I found that the International Society for Technology and Education had some of the best speakers, thanks to a grant from uh, Hewlett Packard, the printer company. And they were giving these marvelous free lectures inside of Second Life. It took me about three months to get over my fear of getting into Second Life to come to those talks. And once I did, I met an amazing group of people there and in the Virginia Society for Tech and Ed and all over the grid who were also interested in education and interested in learning to teach online and were teaching online at various levels from you know grade school on through graduate school. I realized really soon, uh, really quickly, that if I didn't have a purpose inside Second Life, I would just be here all the time, <laughs> going and doing things and playing and listening to live music and so on. So I thought it was a good idea to try and set up some kind of a um, facility that would benefit my husband's and my field of study in a way that we couldn't do in real life. The library itself has been around since August 29th of 2009. I know that because I have a visitor counter from the first day of the, of the library. And we've got just under 5,800 visitors over that last um, seven years, almost seven years. Uh, when we started, we started with that little tiny uh, space up in the top photo. Uh, we only had the first one, the pink building, and then a little later on we got the blue building and expanded out. And then later on, uh, probably a couple of years later, we set up a small discussion forum in another space in the Chilbo community, and we set up um, a small snack bar with a book, little bookstore. Later on in 2011, we were given a, a piece of land on Innovation Island as part of a grant that the Alliance Virtual Libraries had to set up a library. We never completely um, finished, uh, finished that library in the six months we had it, and we didn't have any events in the library, but we were really enjoying um, uh, getting things set up and teaching ourselves how to do what we needed to do to present a library. So our first process was to decide, develop a purpose, and thanks JJ for that reference, um, to develop a purpose, and that was to set up a, a learning center that would give people some familiarity with the field that we were in, to know that there was a scientific side, that scientists, scientists and academics were actually studying psychic phenomena. We needed to find an affordable space. We certainly didn't have the resources to have a library in real life. Um, and the Parapsychology Foundation does have a library, but it's many, many states away from where we are now. So we needed to find a way to do this. And our initial rent was 50 lindens a week for our first space, which was kind of wonderful. We also needed to find a welcome, welcoming community. We ended originally on the Star Trek Museum Island, which is a magnificent bill for anybody who's interested in Star Trek. And the museum itself is extremely well put together, lots of information and so on. But the person who set it up was very antagonistic towards our topic. She was one of those people who didn't believe that there was such a thing as a psychic experience and didn't think that it was in anybody's interest to have people studying people who said they had those experiences because obviously there must be something wrong with them. Well, we disagreed with that significantly and we began a search for a location where we could have a learning center in a community that was very welcoming. And Chilbo community, which was founded by Fleet Took and Tara Yates and Rachel Corleone and a number of other people, was extremely welcoming. We were able to not only set up our little space there, but to expand and they were kind of had an eye on what we were doing and kept offering us more opportunities. And eventually we moved our house from the Star Trek, move, uh, Star Trek Museum Island where we were renting a house. We rented a house in Chilbo. So it means a lot to be in a good community. Um, you've got built-in people that are going to come to your events and there are people that are gonna use the library and people that are proud to have you around. And that made, meant a lot to us. So then the point became, how do we decide, define the space? What do we need to put into the library? And to figure that out, we did a lot of touring around, looking at various Alliance um, libraries 
taking a good look at what they did with the first floor, what they did with the second floor, how they handled the information, how things were organized, what kinds of facilities they had, and decided, well, we want to try and duplicate that insofar as we can, given what our budget is, which wasn't very large. <laughs> And then it became important that we learned how to obtain the materials and the skills and the experience to actually put that library together and make it work. And what we used to do, we divided up the labor in a couple of ways. My husband used to love to do a lot of, um, you'll see him in a minute, used to do a lot of uh, landscaping. And then his big thing was he would head out and go look for places for us to go dance or some amazing installation to go visit take a balloon ride or something, and I would hunker down in the, the library and try to build books that people could read and uh, links to articles and things like that. And when I got a bit tired, he would send me an IM and off we would go and play in Second Life. So it was really a lot of fun. We were literally sitting next to each other in two chairs in the living room, and then later I was in my chair and he was at the dining room table. But it was kind of like a date night nonetheless, so that was a wonderful way to um, divvy up the, the work. So this is a panorama of Route 9 in the Chilbo community. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying the name of the continent right, but it's uh, Jegiot. I think it's Jegiot, but it's one of the continents of um, Second Life. And this is the Chilbo Education Village. If you see that blue banner that's sort of to the right of the of the screen right next to it, it says started out here in 2009, and that's that pink building that we started out in. There was a different blue building next to us at that point, and we expanded into that pretty quickly a couple of months later. Eventually, um, the person who was managing the land in the neighborhood uh, offered us that orange building all the way at the end of the street, and we moved there in 2011. Later on, uh, we bought that. Uh, we we bought a lot of that land when the people were feeling the the hit of the economic downturn, and Fleet Took went on to open SimGrid and other Avicon and other activities that she had. Um, and then I added a third floor to the to the building. So we started out at one end in a little space and ended up at the other end in a bigger space. And then right next to that orange building at the end there is the SL MOOC building, Integrating Technology Building. And that's where the Second Life MOOC headquarters is. And then in between we have a couple of freebie stores, one focused on clothing and the other one focused on educational tools. And lots of rent, uh, renters around doing wonderful things. There's lots of great things in Chilbo. I put into the box a thing called the walking and flying tour of Jobo, and that gives you an introduction to a lot of what was what is around the neighborhood. So to the left, that's uh, Rodolfo Mirabella, my husband, whose name is Carlos Alvarado in real life, and me in front of our very first uh, little learning center. And as you might, uh, you probably can't see, but all the way back there on the wall next to the video viewer is the original, um, well, it's the same one we have now, visitor counter, and it shows that three whole people other than us had visited the learning center at that point. It was before we had our open house. Um, and then the other picture I took last night in front of the current Desire Library, and you can see that um, Rodolfo is wearing one of Agile Bill uh, uh, Krebs' uh, yellow hats, which he always wears when he's working in Second Life. And we have our Azire t-shirts on, thanks to Lily uh, Zanzibar, who uh, makes all of our t-shirts and lives in the neighborhood. So this is the first floor. It's resing in. Um, this is the first floor of the Learning Center. I have a reception desk and then information on the walls. And you can see some uh, boards in the back that link through to YouTube events for the Parapsychology Foundation and for the Azire itself. We also have a little snack bar you'll see in another picture on the main floor. What I got from um, touring all the libraries uh, that I could find in Second Life initially was that you put the general information on the first floor as people walk in, things that you think people really need right away, and you get more specific as you get into other spaces of the library, whether it's a collection room or another floor or another building. Um, so that was kind of how I was thinking about it. Our uh, Christine Christan, who was at the time the uh, person who managed commercial real estate in Chilbo, now we're a little bit more loosely um, um, 
connected to each other. We're basically a neighborhood of friends now rather than a functioning community um, in, in the sense of having a lot of governance. Um, but Christine did a lot of building around the area and she brought in that baobab tree, which you're seeing that round uh, pillar behind my desk is actually the bottom of a baobab tree that goes up to the second story next to the mezzanine. So we start out with general stuff on the first floor. And one of the things that we have, and I've put all of the names of these folks, and you can really only see them when you download the um, uh, uh, PowerPoint, but we have a wall of important contributors to the scientific study of psychic phenomena. So these are people who take very seriously the possibility that there is such a thing as telepathy, that there is such a thing as precognition, is such a thing as clairvoyance, all these ways of coming into contact with the world that go beyond um, our five physical senses. And many of these people are from some very interesting places. And the first guy on the left in the top row is Brian Josephson, who's a Nobel laureate and is at the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University. And all the way to the right at the bottom, you can't really see him, is Dr. Ray Noted Everard from um, the University of Strasbourg. So it's an international group of people. I have another three to put up. Um, and what you can do with these boards is click on them. The board itself will tell you who the person is, what their affiliation is, show you a picture of them in real life, and then you click and it takes you through to their websites and gives you more information about them and also their publications. So in a sense, our library um, is, is outward focused. It's a bridge to the, the real world. Uh, I hate to use real life and real world because I really, you know, this is real too. Um, but folks who may not ever have been in Second Life, but whose work is very indicative of what scientists and academics are doing, trying to find out how telepathy happens and is precognition real and how can you test for it and what does it mean and what are the traditions and all that kind of stuff um, that surround these things. So that's one one of the aspects of the first floor. We also have a, a list here of our advisory committee. We have five, uh, uh, I'm sorry, seven individuals who are on the advisory board for the ASIRE. We called it the Alvarado Zingroni Institute for Research and Education, basically because we were trying to find some kind of an acronym that, that sounded really good and would be easy to use. Um, and neither one of us really wanted to use our names in the name of the institution, but we had a colleague who said, oh, for heaven's sakes, do that because the desire, that's easy to remember. So these individuals are um, also scientists. Um, it's Alvarado Zingroni. That Alvarado is my husband, Carl says Alvarado Zingroni is me. Um, Institute for Research and Education. It's actually a project of our consulting company. Um, and uh, that's how we, how we conceive of it. It's our teaching project. So we teach on the social media teaching platform, WizIQ. We also teach in Second Life and have the desire stuff in Second Life. And we now have a YouTube channel as well. So that's kind of the Azire project. Um, and this is our advisory board. Mostly all, they're all academics of one sort or another with um, different, different uh, um, interests and, and uh, focuses of their research or the work that they do for the field. And we contact them periodically to ask questions about things that we're going to be doing and whether they would help with us or not. Um, let me write this down so you've got it in the chat. That would be better. Um, it's uh, the Alvarado Zingroni Institute for Research and Education. And the website is um, www.desire.org. There's also one that's a dot com, but that's for the um, that's for the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the consulting uh, business actually. To the right hand side, you see the Parapsychology Foundation staff um, and uh, research fellows and research associate, and uh, that's Gonzalo all the way down at the at the right hand side in the bottom, and I'm next to him, and above me is Carlos. Um, and this this is a group of folks that we all work with, and um, they're a wonderful bunch of people. And the oh, one of the only reasons why we're having Paramook is because 
we're able to be supported by by Lisa Coley, who's a very um, generous and wonderful person. So this is the uh, still the first floor, and what we've done here is we've put up a bookcase of recommended books. That's off to the right there. The short bookcase that's in the front that's not completely filled, those are recent books um, in their philosophy, research, history, all kinds of uh, uh, things like that. A few skeptical books put in, especially a lot of theory. Um, a couple of them are anthologies of all the research that's been going on in the field from different points of view. So these are things that you can click on and it takes you out to Amazon.com where you can read about the book and purchase it if you'd like, but it gives you uh, kind of a set of recommended readings if you're interested in the scientific side of the field. We also have books from some very um, reflective uh, experiencers such as uh, the remote viewer Joe McMonagall that are in this list of books. On the wall there at the very back you'll see Brian Josephson's face again. That's a website viewer with 51 websites of individual researchers units and university um, units um, where parapsychology is part of the remit or where people are interested. On the second floor, you can see the top of the Baobab tree. And this is just a discussion forum that we use, a discussion space that's used both by um, an Edgar Casey's uh, study group run by Nina Lancaster, who you might have seen at the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education conference talking about positive psychology and positive change. She was also in our Second Life MOOC that I uh, co-organized with Nellie Homewood and Peonia Destiny in April. Um, so the, it's used for various things, but also as the monthly discussion forum uh, after the live classes in the Paramook course is finished and um, the weekly discussion forums for um, the Paramook when the live classes are in session. And you can see it's got a PowerPoint board at the end from one of the things that we were talking about, one of our discussion days. The third floor is where we get kind of more into the detail, and it's set up for a lot more um, uh, books than it's got, and I'm hoping to keep filling this out. It's got one of these ever-increasing little tables where every time you sit down, you know, a new chair pops up. The uh, uh, fireplace has a mantelpiece that has old books in psychology, such as Williams James, William James's Principles in Psychology and old books in psychical research and parapsychology. The top part will have some more. You can click on those titles and it'll take you out to freely available books that are available online that you can sometimes download but certainly read. The little articles that you see sort of broken out in that picture to the left hand side, this was an idea I got from one of the libraries that I visited and I don't remember now which one it was. They had put up a number of articles that they thought their patrons would be interested in and each article was in a wall board that had the title of the article, the journal, the publication date, and the authors on it, and then a logo from the actual library. When you clicked on it, it would send you out to a resource on the internet where you could find that article and read it and or download it without a fee. Sometimes we've had, I've had to go through here a couple of times and check all the links because findarticles.com is not out there anymore and sometimes academia.edu is a better resource. But all of these are available and what we have now are two languages. The first two bookcases on either side of the fireplace are materials in Spanish and the other three bookcases are materials in English. And these are surveys of people who have, have uh, experiences and how they feel about them and what other kinds of psychological characteristics they might have. Uh, research reports on experimental um, research, things on distant healing, things on the field itself, theories of consciousness, and other kinds of things that are related to parapsychology and the whole enterprise of trying to figure out how do these things work and how can we understand them. Eventually, I have a backlist of uh, articles in France, French, German, Italian and Portuguese and I'm hoping to get those up onto the library shelves and I'm hoping also to use one of the walls as a uh, spot 
for giving links to specific YouTube videos that I think people would be interested in. We also have, that you don't see in this particular picture, we also have a number of wall boards that go directly out to some of the main and most important websites in the field and our media on a prim so they're live and you can kind of search them live while you're standing there. So the third floor is conceived of as the meat of the library in terms of the primary literature of the field. And I try to keep it up um, and make sure that we have some recent stuff up there as well as some classics. So you got to rest once in a while. So the other thing that we have in the library is the meditation porch, which is underneath the cupola. And basically um, there's a couple of med meditation pillows and a meditation bench that were made by Lily Zanzibar. Um, and you can sit up there and meditate and take a look at the community, watch the sunrise uh, because there's a nice window out to the east. Or you can ride this wonderful big bird um, that I got for Carlos one, one summer or one spring when it was his birthday. And, uh, and the bird is very cute and chirps all the time and eats from that little plate of food that Christine made for us. So that's there. And to get around in the building, we use something called an everywhere door that you can get on the marketplace. You pair them up. One, they give them the same name and put them in different locations. And when you click on it and open it, it finds the uh, door that shares its name. And you click on the vortex that appears inside the door and you're immediately transported to that other location. So we use that for people to get around in the building and get up on the roof and get into the meditation space as well as the uh, staircases. So why the pyramid? And um, we bought this wonderful wordle that we use as our course logo from an artist called Radiant Skies on the stock and uh, cartoon site, www123rf.com, one of my favorite places on the internet. We just think it's really well done. Um, and so we use it for all our courses. So the Paramount motivation was essentially similar to building the library that now supports it to get out the story of what scientific parapsychology really is and to get it out in an authentic way that doesn't shy away from its um, controversial nature. So once again, it's a highly controversial field of study. It's scientific academic study of psychic phenomena, multidisciplinary, multinational, and the real work is obscured by distortions and exaggerations in popular media. I can now tell you in that first uh, uh, line of the folks on the staircase, the, the lady in the blue shirt is me and standing next to me um, in the front is uh, Jim Matlock, who's an anthropologist, who's also a research fellow for the Parapsychology Foundation and teaches a course on the Isaiah Moodle. Let me give you that, um, uh, that link called Signs of uh, Reincarnation. And it's a very, very deep course that looks at the traditions and the beliefs as well as research that was done on reincarnation on children's past life memories by Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia which is a place where we looked and all the way up in the very last um, line of people at the very top of that star staircase, second from the left is, is Carlos. So it was the same kind of motivation. We wanted to make sure people knew that the science was being done and that there was information out there that was beyond what they were getting on television and on YouTube at that point. So the structure of our course was like a lot of these massively open online uh, courses. It was multi-platform. There were six weeks of live classes, six months of additional monthly discussion forums, lots of how-to tutorials, not only for the people who were going to come into Second Life for the Second Life uh, discussion forums, but also how to use um, the Google Calendar and the WizIQ frame and how to work around in the classroom and how to ask questions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there were a lot of tutorials to help bring people into the course and make them feel comfortable with the course. The course structure included introductory lectures that Carlos and I gave, and then research lectures by uh, guest speakers, as well as possibilities to obtain a certificate, which is something I'm still struggling with. We had a, quite a lot of people, about 300 people from the first course who have uh, completed work for certificates and about 20 people from the second course so far. 
So, so that's basically the structure of the course. And what you're seeing here are the two wall boards that are at the back of the Azire Library, where you can click through and request um, an enrollment to the 2015 version on that bottom wall board. And on the top, you can click through and join the SL MOOC 2016, which is still in progress. You'll see on the side, we had 1,041 students as of this morning in the old course, and 300 and uh, actually, I think it's 314 students in the new course. We didn't do very much marketing for the new course, mainly because um, we were so busy. So we didn't get have quite as wide a reach as what, excuse me, have quite as wide a reach as we did with the first course. In our 2017 course, we're going to pick up the marketing again. Um, so let me go on to the next slide here. This is basically the platforms that we use to the top left as it's resing in. That's a picture of the webinar frame in WizIQ. Um, and let me write that down in here too. It's called www.wizIQ.com. If you're in any of Nellie Deutsch's uh, English as a Second Language or Teaching with Technology networks, you'll know WizIQ very well because that's one of the platforms that she uses um, for her teaching practice. And certainly, Carlos and I have been using it for quite a while. Um, the second to the the second one on the top to the right, that's what WizIQ looks like. Um, in the back end, it shows you all the courses you're registered for and when they're coming up, and then they're all recorded, and you can download the recordings. Then we edit from those, and they go out on YouTube, which is in the bottom right-hand corner. That's the Parapsychology Foundation YouTube page, and then we also have a YouTube page called Parapsychology Online, as well as a WordPress blog called Parapsychology Online that we didn't really use very much this year. You'll find all of that information on the note card in the box here at the front of the room. To the right hand si uh, right, uh, left hand side on the bottom, of course, is the discussion room. We had about we had about 20 people, 24 people, I think, from the first course who were regulars in the Second Life discussion forum. This year, we run between six and ten, and it's kind of now that we're at the end of the six months almost. We're down to about um, maybe 10 people in the WizIQ discussion forum, which happens right before it, and about six people inside of Second Life. And we tend to talk about just whatever we want, not just what we were talking about in the discussion forums. Uh, Carlos is the one who takes care of finding us our speakers and um, uh, setting up the schedule. And then I do the training of the speakers to talk uh, if they've never been in a webinar situation. I, uh, I take care of their training, and then I do quite a bit of other uh, work in terms of coordination and so on with them and the students. So where Paramook lives now are on the Parapsychology Online and the Parapsychology Foundation YouTube channels. And you can see these are three of the lectures that were given over the last two years. This gives you a better um, look at the speakers. The one on the bottom is the very first one we did. We had 23 speakers, and it was better than a full-time job. We were really working all the time to get everybody trained up and make sure everything was OK, and then moderate the courses and be in every single one of the webinars. Carlos always provides extra information about the topics and where to find books and so on in the webinar frame and then I just do the regular moderation of the course and talking to the students and so on. We encourage a very uh, lively chat box. The top one um, is from this year we decided to, uh, well actually the is the top one uh, yeah, the top one is from this year, sorry. And we decided to knock down the number of outside presenters that we had to about 13 just because the workload was a, a lot harder. And we up, up, uh, was too hard the previous year. And we upped the number of members of our organizational team. And you'll see some of the PF staff in, in that picture and Gonzalo and then Carlos and I at the end. So we had a lot of people, and our philosophy was we assumed that everybody was capable of deciding whether or not this was a great class for them. There was no hard feelings whatsoever if people dipped in and said, ooh, too scientific, don't want to watch this. 
Um, uh, and, and certainly people could come in whenever they wanted to come in and we were as flexible as possible. If someone wanted to get a certificate, but they were working at the moment and they needed to kind of start the certificate work, maybe a lot later, all of that was just okay with us. So people, we tr treated everybody as colleagues and as people who had the right to choose what was in their interest area. And we were very gratified by the fact that a lot of these researchers actually stuck around in the course and watched some of the recordings. And a few of them, like Dr. Patricio Trisoldi from the University of Padua in Italy, came to a lot of other of his colleagues' talks, which we thought was really quite wonderful. So we also tried to embody the controversial nature of the field. So we didn't shy away from the fact that some people don't think we should be doing what we're doing or that these experiences um, may signal some kind of psychopathology. We did have a, a skeptic in our first year speak, but we've had difficulty finding skeptics that are um, respectful and uh, able to manage the kinds of questions and answers that they'll get from experiencers because many of our students are, many of our learners are experiencers. Christopher French from uh, Goldsmith College in the University of London system was the guy that took up the skeptic mantle in the first uh, iteration of the course. And in the second iteration of the course, um, it was more internal. Dr. Dick Beerman from the University of Amsterdam talked about some of the problems with research in parapsychology from the point of view of insi an insider, and so that served as the skeptic voice. And we also gave materials about the other side of the coin, what other people were thinking, even though we very strongly believe that these experiences are out there and that they mean something profound about our, the nature of our physical world and about our nature as human beings. And then we also wanted to embody the multidisciplinary and multinational character of the field. So Carlos was uh, very much mindful of the fact that we wanted people from a lot of different countries to give talks. We wanted them to be from different disciplines. We had a religious studies guy. We had anthropologists. We had um, uh, other uh, people from France and England and Brazil and so on. So we... we uh, wanted to make sure that people understood that this was a, an international enterprise. Not a whole lot of people, but definitely spread out across the world. So the, the practical expression of our philosophy was that we scheduled live sessions, but we archived the materials for self-paced review. So you could either come live or you could just see the recordings. The live sessions were scheduled one per day, which meant that the length of the session was up to the speaker and to the attendees. And if somebody wanted to talk for two and a half hours and the students were ready for that to happen, that was fine. This year we actually had a, um, Dr. Jan Holden's presentation on near-death experiences ended up being two two-hour sessions. Um, and it was all up to the students and the faculty member, however long they wanted to keep talking. Um, not each live session had a discussion in Second Life. Every week we had a discussion in Second Life um, up to the end of the live classes. And then now we're having uh, discussions in Second Life every Sunday, last Sunday of every month, on a specific topic that's determined by the people who are in the um, in the discussion forum. We have a WizIQ discussion forum at 2 and a um, Second Life discussion forum at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, and the same thing with the, the Second Life discussions, whatever we wanted to do, whatever we wanted to talk about, however long we wanted to hang around with each other, and sometimes we'd get the discussion done and we'd go off to explore Second Life together. So it's just very open in terms of how people want to be involved because we're doing this one event a day. The course design, we try to anticipate the learner's needs and we try to listen to feedback. And in a sense, one of the, the most important pieces of feedback we got validated both the setting up of the Azire and the setting up of this course. And that was people were routinely saying, um, I, ha I had no idea, this was the most common content comment in 2015 and a very common comment in 2016. People would say, I had absolutely no idea that scientists and academics or people in universities were even interested in these phenomena 
much less doing research on the phenomena. So clearly we have a lot of work to do to get out the idea that there are some folks who take this very seriously and who are doing solid research on, on these topics. And research that is in the main respectful to folks who have experiences because that's been a problem in the past that scientists kind of separate themselves from the people with the experiences. And the people with the experiences know how they feel and what they mean and when they started and what kind of information they give them and so on. So it's important to keep talking to the experiences, experiencers. And I love this particular picture because it kind of represents the whole Paramook and online education in general and, sec and the vision and mission of Second Life and other virtual worlds that have um, educational components. This is Dr. Fatima R. Um, uh, Machado sitting at her desk in um, Archibaya in Brazil, which is a little town outside of, in the Sao Paulo province, but outside of the city of Sao Paulo. And she was watching the very last session of the 2015 MOOC, the last live session on her computer upstairs and you can't quite see it but if you zoom in you can see that down below her monitor is a little device that her husband Dr. Wellington Zimbari was watching sitting downstairs on another floor of their house and he came upstairs put the device on her table and then took a picture about 50 people from the original um, Paramook 2015 were on for that final session and they were using their drawing tools on the whiteboard to put up smiley faces and comments and all that about how they had felt about the experience of being in the course. So we get this picture in North Carolina, it was taken in Brazil and on the screen are people from 40 other countries uh, writing comments and talking about what the course had meant to them. So I think that's a really good symbol of of what this kind of international um, online education can do and can be. So I'm at the, the, um, the, a little bit more of the detail. I'm gonna go a little fast through these. these. This is the stats from Paramount 15. We had 809 learners when the sessions ended. We have 1,041 today. 58 countries of origin at the end of the live sessions. I think we hit about 90 countries by the time I stopped counting. 339 cities represented from all over the world. 60 people finished the requirements for the certificate so far. There were about 300 who attempt, uh, attempted it, and I'm still working my way through those folks. A core group of about 15 people attended the discussions through August of 2015 in the webinar frame or in the virtual world Second Life. And then you can just see, just for fun, the top uh, nine uh, cities where people were from in terms of registration from those cities. And these are some of the presentations. One was about a project called the Global Consciousness Project. And then there's several other uh, research articles here. If you cam in on them, you can see what they were. And if you download the website, you can see what they were. So in 2016, as I said, we didn't do very much marketing at all. Um, we had 215 learners when the live sessions ended. 314 are in the course today. The course is still in progress. We're still taking uh, red, uh, registrations. Our uh, July uh, discussion forums are on the last Sunday of July and the August one's the last Sunday of August and then the course will be over. Although people can still register and go through at their own pace. The live sessions went from January 18th through February 24th, discussion forums occurring once a month in the webinar frame, actually once a week in the webinar frame, and now we have, the live sessions are closed, we have them going every once a month until August 30th. And then Paramook uh, 2017, Carlos will be sitting down and working on who we're going to recruit for that course, and these are a few of the um, presentations that were given. Professor Antonia Mills from the University of Northern British Columbia talked about uh, past life memories in children. We had a, a gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Bill Everest, who talked about exceptional experiences of people in training to be a medium. This was a um, this is the physics talk by Professor Bernard Carr from Queen Mary, Univer Queen Mary College, part of the University of London system on hyperspatial models of, of psi, how you can explain these kinds of psychic phenomena through, through physics as it stands now and, and with some extensions. And then this one was a, a presentation on healing and dissonant intention by Dr. Stefan Schmidt from Freiburg. So it's a very varied group of presentations. 
So the future um, basically is that we hope to continue to re improve the Azire library and keep it up to date and make it more usable, not only for um, our courses, but for other courses that we're hoping to have based only in Second Life. We want to continue working towards bringing the Parapsychology Foundation fully online, Gonzalo and, and myself and my husband and uh, the, some of the other staff members are very heavily involved in bringing out 51 years worth of film to the Parapsychology Foundation's YouTube channel, as well as developing new content that will help people understand this particular side of the field. And we're doing the same thing with our Parapsychology Online uh, channel as well, the Azire's uh, Parapsychology Online YouTube channel, o only at a slower pace. Um, and then we're hoping to continue to disseminate the work of the field through the Azire teaching projects on WizIQ in Second Life and on YouTube. And of course, um, Paramook 2017 is, is uh, certainly on the agenda for the rest of the year. So these are some of the links that you can get when you download the PowerPoint, and that's a picture of my husband's blog, which is an extremely good blog to follow because he talks about all kinds of aspects of the field, historical, books, uh, research, uh, individuals. It's called Parapsychology News, History, and Research, and it's www.carlossalvarado.wordpress.com, and let me put this in the chat so you can pick it up now. It's, it's a very, very good resource. It's been going on for quite some time, and he puts out a new post usually every week, and sometimes he gets inspired and does two a week. So that's something, if you're interested in the field, would be a great resource for you. And then here are the links to some things that we recommend, as well as our own um, YouTube channel. So that's something you can get not only inside, um, yeah, I'm just, this is my last slide, really, um, only inside the uh, note card that I've got here in the note card giver. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. And just for the heck of it, I put up the two of us um, in, uh, in real life on this last slide, uh, just because everything that we do is definitely um, definitely a joint operation. So if you're interested in, in getting in touch, you can IM me, Maggie Laramore, or email me at nancyfdesire.org. And, and that's me, <laughs> if anybody has any questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. If anyone has any questions for um, Maggie, feel free to type that in text chat. And um, uh, I, I thank you so much. This is very fascinating work. It's it's uh, was a truly interesting uh, program. And um, I want I have a few brief announcements here, but we can be watching the text chat to see if anyone has any questions. While I'm just mentioning a couple things about our ACRL Virtual World Interest Group, as well as things going on in CVL. Um, Joe's asking if you have regular hours or um, if you serve mainly as a conduit to information services. It's mainly a conduit to information sources. I'm not in world as much as I used to be, and I'm hoping to be in world on a more regular basis starting in the fall. It's a, um, I did that at the beginning, especially when we were on Innovation Island. Um, but uh, now there's so many other things going on that you can IM me and I'll hear about you and uh, I'll get back to you as fast as I can. I have all my IMs coming to me in my email, so I won't miss them, even if they get capped. Um, actually, no, but that's a wonderful idea, JJ. JJ is asking, do you have a training course for how to be a skeptic without losing your manners? Um, that's been a problem on both sides of the line in our in our field and in the field of those who criticize us, because there are a lot of skeptics out there, like like Dr. Chris French, who are well, not a lot, but there's some out there, like Dr. Chris French, who are extremely patient, definitely have a different point of view, but have an awful lot of very important things to say. And there are folks in our field that tend to get grumpy about it. And then there's folks in the skeptics um, community that tend to get grumpy about it as well. So that's a great idea. I love that idea. We'll have to think about that. It's, 50, it's going to be 5,800 soon. It's uh, uh, 50, I think it's 5,797 at the moment. So we're very excited about that. It's starting from three, not too bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
No, no. Um, uh, we develop and design and uh, manage the MOOC courses um, uh, in on you know YouTube and in uh, WizIQ primarily and through the Google Calendar and so on. We also um, uh, Carlos does all the recruitment. I do all the training of the speakers. Many of our speakers have never, ever done an online webinar, much less um, uh, taught online or taken advantage of an online course. So we're teaching, and we teach the basic introductory stuff, history and so on. It's quite a task, yeah, and, it, and that's one of the reasons why we're so grateful to have uh, Lisa Coley of the Parapsychology Foundation thinking of this as something very important to do because we get paid. Um, for all those hours, and that's really wonderful. The library itself um, started before the Paramook, and it supports the Paramook in the sense that um, uh, students can go there to read the material. Some of the materials have overlap, but it's also an, a wider outreach, the library, to uh, residents of Second Life. I like that, JJ, that's a great title, Polite Discourse Across Metaphysical Commitments 101. I think we all could use that course. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and type in text chat about our next uh, month's meeting as well while anyone else is thinking of any questions or other comments for, for Nan, Maggie here. We're going to have Kevin Feenan, who's president of the Rockcliffe University Consortium, talking about the Rockcliffe Library Network and um, how that is going and the future plans that they have for future development in virtual worlds. I also want to um, put in the text chat our CVL calendar, infoisland.org. We are currently working on having, making, creating some uh, machinima orientation videos, and we just worked on our first one, and it's there on the calendar. And also, if you click on news uh, at the Info Island um, calendar, click on news, you will see some different events that are coming up to close our summer exhibit. And um, Nan Zingrone here, Maggie, uh, also presented over there at our exhibit area. To your right, we still have a lot of exhibits up for the summer on virtual world librarianship, and we're holding a grand finale, two events, one on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock on July 30th, so that people in other time zones can come and see these exhibits, tour them, and network. And then a grand finale celebration with a summertime theme on August the 2nd at 7 o'clock in the evening. So you'll be receiving notices or information about that, um, or you can look on the, the calendar. But I wanted to say some exciting things happening at the Community Virtual Library that really any of you might uh, be interested in, in joining. We have several projects that we're working on that where people can promote the work they're doing in virtual worlds here at CVL with better signage and links to what you're doing. We put a sign up to uh, Maggie's work here um, over at Chilbo. And so if you walk between the old reference desk and the main library, there are signs that you can click on and get landmarks to go to these other virtual libraries and spaces. So such as Caledon, which of course you all are familiar with, one of probably the world's earliest virtual world ever library, <laughs> and um, and other places of interest around um, around Second Life. So um, that's one thing that we're working on. And if you know of libraries that are great or educational spaces that libraries can share, help us out by dropping um, you know a, a, a little note to me about the, um, that place that we can go explore. Maybe create a link. Also, we have updated our whole vision of virtual world reference because many of you who worked here at CVL in the past know that reference in a virtual world is not like reference in a physical world and it's not like you just have people walking in asking questions at a at the at the reference desk so we're considering it more of office hours where you can work in a virtual world and be at the main library doing other things as people come and interact and network with you with whatever kinds of needs they have. So if that sounds interesting, click there on the, um, on the infoisland.org link. If you click on calendars and you go to reference, you'll see our new reference desk calendar is up to date. Finally, there are not any names on there that are people that are no longer currently working in Second Life. So we really want to update that. And if that sounds appealing to you, just hanging out in the main library for, say, an hour, sometime, just once a week, um, feel free to contact me or Sue Moon Magic or Rocky Vallejo. They are the two that are helping train volunteers. 
um, even um, those people who are friends of the library, not necessarily a, a real world librarian with a master's in library science. Uh, if you're a, a friend of the library that would like to help out, contact us and you can, you're welcome to use that library for office hours and just be there for say an hour and you know, work and network because we want to have as many people um, there where people can um, collaborate, not just with second, you know, with the community virtual library, but with the entire educational community in virtual worlds. Because we, it seems like we all isolate ourselves in these little tiny communities and then try to reinvent the wheel and say, hey, come see what we're doing. We'd rather expand and join a bigger community of, net, you know, of uh, a bigger network of communities so that we can be a library of communities, not just a library of this one small you know, small, small sim, if that makes sense to you. So that's, that's another idea. And some of the fun things that you might want to help work on, not only reference services, we're working on a hypergrid resource center. And I hope, hopefully I'm not talking too fast. If I am, tell me to slow down. Cause I, I want you, if you walk up the hill, the old reference desk is just, was just abandoned there. And we were thinking, what can we use that reference desk area for? It's kind of shaped already like a spaceship. It's kind of round and circular. And um, so what we're thinking of doing is creating a hypergrid center to other virtual worlds besides Second Life. In Worlds, Kitely, OpenSim, Avacon, lots of different spaces where people are creating great educational con um, content and where librarians are also working and exploring. So, but people are like, well, how do I get there? How do I go to OpenSim? How do I go to all the, you know, you hear about, oh, they're having a, a conference in Avacon. How do I get there? And it's really hard to go find out how. So we're going to put resources in this area where you could learn how to go to another virtual world. Because um, we all know Second Life is not the only virtual world in the world, you know, and it's, we still are committed to Second Life as the main space where people can come and initial, initially learn about virtual worlds. But we're not, you know, tied to this forever and ever. So, so we're thinking of, you know, creating a hub to go to other virtual worlds. And if that sounds interesting, contact me later because I could definitely use your help working on that. As well as is our bookmobile, which you'll see just wander around the island here. We have a bookmobile that we're working on ways to embed librarianship in virtual world spaces through a bookmobile. And also, I'll just put one more text thing here. Um, we have on our news, uh, if you go to news on the, um, on the website, You'll also see the, those end of summer um, plans for the finale dance and the uh, finale tour. Just another chance to network together to, um, you know, to, to talk and see how your work can be featured in virtual worlds and how you can network with other professionals. So uh, let me know if you have any questions about that. And again, a, a huge thank you to you, Maggie um, Nan, for this great program. So if you have more questions for Maggie or for me, I'll, I'll stop talking now. Thanks. Thanks, Val. Well, I hope you um, all have picked up a landmark and will come by and see the library. Um, and I love this idea of library hours over here. Let's see what I can do to get trained up. Um, there's a lot of material in the library and in the neighborhood is just fantastic. So also uh, take the, the Chilbo walking flying tour. It needs a few more, a few more entries to it because we've got two new, two new uh, areas that are just being built out. So we hope that you would join us there. We also have um, Expedition Central, um, one of the uh, sites that, uh, um, um, Cyrus Hush had set up where you can go up and, and get all kinds of wonderful um, links to other places around the grid. And there's a wonderful, um, uh, there's a haunted house, there's a lake, there's all kinds of great stuff. So we hope you'll come and visit the community as well. Thanks, Val. I will definitely get in touch with you.
Great. And this has been a really great um, presentation, and it was uh, nice to see all of you here today. And uh, don't forget, if you walk up there and see um, those landmarks that are kind of between the old ref desk and the main library, you may think, oh, you're definitely missing some really great places that I know of, because <laughs> it's, it's really hard to keep, you know, um, keep up with all the great simulations here in Second Life. And we also have that little um, old replica of a card catalog there by the reference desk which has been moved to the main library and we are trying to make sure that all the sims listed in that when you click on that link and go to the spreadsheet are current and have current contact information so uh, it's, it's kind of a, a never-ending job as you know places in Second Life come and go but um, but we're, we're sending out um, you know, people to just go on a little virtual hunt, check out a landmark, see if it's still there, what's going on, and so we can help um, collaborate with different communities and spaces within Second Life. Well, thanks again, you guys. I'm going to have to um, uh, take off and, and go do some household stuff. It was really an honor to be here, and thank you, Val, for the opportunity, and it was lots of fun to tell you about our activities. And if you're interested, get in touch with me, because we always like to have more students and so on. I'm going to pick up the um, PowerPoint now, and if you want um, anything out of that, that little giver box that you haven't gotten yet, please go ahead and uh, click on it before I walk away with that as well. And thanks, Val, for this wonderful picture of the building. It's just so beautiful. It's really wonderful. And have a good day, everybody. Picking up the giver box now. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. See you all later. And thank you so much. Like, if you haven't decided to subscribe, maybe pretty please you could.